I think there'll be more frightened capital that'll move out of conventional investments and into the metals than ever before. Certainly, the money supply is bigger than it's ever been on a global basis. And it's a world market, not just a bunch of uh, you know Americans that are concerned about us, you know, bifurcating from a sound money system into a fiat only system. I do expect once that move begins in earnest, where we get into kind of the panic move, where the fear of missing out takes hold of the consciousness and it's global rather than national. I still expect to see some pretty spectacular moves in the metals. David Morgan is the famed publisher of The Morgan Report and the author of several books about investing in the precious metals industry. He believes we are in the third stage of the ongoing bull market, which is the most exciting phase, as metals prices typically rise more during this phase than at any other point in the bull market. David is particularly excited about silver and believes the metals price could still double from current prices before the bull market ends. According to David, one reason he is still so bullish on gold and silver prices is because there aren't many investments, except cryptocurrencies, that are true alternatives to traditional asset classes like real estate, bonds, and stocks. Yet, according to warnings from several expert analysts, these sectors are heading for very precarious times. As a result, David believes there will be more frightened capital moving out of conventional assets into gold, silver, and other metals. The panic into precious metals and related investments and away from conventional assets like treasury bonds started with central banks in 2021. These are the world's most well-informed investors, with many resources at their disposal. In addition, they know much more about the global financial system than all other types of investors, so they can perceive trouble from a million miles away. This is exactly what experts like David believe is happening. The central banks have caught the first whiff of trouble, and they are running for the hills by investing in two tangible assets that have saved the world for thousands of years. David explains that retail and institutional investors are finally catching up to the situation and realizing that they need to get their money out of the system as soon as possible. For these reasons, David says gold and silver prices still have a lot of room to run even higher before the bull market ends. We will now bring you clips from David's recent interview with Liberty and Finance. But before we do, please help us reach more viewers by giving this video a thumbs up, sharing it with others, and subscribing to the channel. You can also activate the notification bell to be instantly notified whenever we upload a video. Thanks for your support, and enjoy the video. Right now, uh, the precious metals markets are pretty much in a consolidation phase. Um, you could say on a trading, from a trading perspective, they're overbought and they need to correct, need to take a breather, the old adage, back and fill. So we need to gain another level of support for both gold and silver. But uh, adding on to what you opened with, Elijah, you know, it wasn't just three months ago that we were kind of wondering, is, you know, 2000 going to be support or resistance, as you said? And of course, obviously, it's now support. We had a nice big move up past 2400 US dollar terms. And I've been asked to write a missive for a, um, a publication, which I write for three, four times a year. And he wanted me to comment on the gold's all-time high. And in that missive, I said, it's only a nominal all-time high. If you use the U.S. government CPI calculator, so we're using their numbers, you need $3,222 gold to equal the purchasing power of a 1980 $850 gold. I think that's important, really not for maybe our viewers, but someone that's coming on board now, like, uh, well, gold is too high. You know, it's its all-time high. It's all-time nominal only. So coming back to the other question, I think we may, I looked at the chart. I mean, I've done a lot of technical work. I don't feature it a lot in the Morgan Report, but we look at it from time to time. It looks like it could do a head and shoulders top. I really doubt that with the um, all this going on geopolitically, the war of drums, uh, the conflicts increasing with Iran involved now. I mean, I can see a correction, a high level consolidation of the further move up. Silver's launched later than gold. We all knew this time gold had to lead the way it has. I really want to see silver over 30. And from my perspective, Elijah, to finish, I do not see this as the high point for the year. I think we're going to get over 30 for silver and 
probably hit the 25 mark at least in, in the gold market. So I see the market from the construct right now, both in the physical realm and in the futures markets, uh, going into the summer's doldrums, meaning that the metals pull back in the summer as they almost always do. And then there's a gap in the chart for silver at 26 something, 30, I believe, somewhere in that. I expect that gap to be filled. I don't expect it to go a lot below that, maybe 25 or so. And I think that'll take most of the summer. Yield added sell in May and come back after Labor Day. So I think that'll hold for the metals as well as the general stock market. And we'll be able to come back in probably late summer, early fall. And we'll start to build from wherever we end up back up. And, of course, the black swan factor is always out there. We always have to think about it. That could change everything almost instantly. But barring that, I think we'll get a down market through the summer months and up market starting in the fall. It would be really interesting to see what happens going toward the November election. You know, how much turmoil, consternation, uh, you know, what's going on with not only market activity, but the rhetoric from the mainstream press, the mainstream financial press, uh, the world commentary on the U.S. election. A lot going on this year. I think the best thing to do is be balanced. You need some precious metals. You don't have to overload, but you don't want to be underweighted. Either. There is absolutely no doubt that another banking crisis is imminent in the United States. On Friday, yet another regional U.S. bank, Republic First Bancorp, had to be rescued by fellow Pennsylvania-based bank Fulton Financial Corporation. Late Friday, Fulton said its subsidiary Fulton Bank had acquired all the assets and deposits of Republic. The acquisition was made through an auction run by the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation after state banking regulators seized the troubled regional bank earlier on Friday. According to a statement from Fulton, it acquired assets worth approximately $6 billion in the transaction including a $2 billion investment portfolio and around $2.9 billion in loans. It acquired another $5.3 billion in liabilities, including deposits of $4 billion and other borrowings and liabilities of roughly $1.3 billion. Another bank bites the dust, with many more to come, by all indications. During his interview with Liberty and Finance, David talks about the subtly yet important shift of power from the West to the East. It used to be that he who controlled the money controlled the world. David says today, it's he who controls the gold that controls the world. Let's get back to David's interview. The idea that he who owns the gold makes the rules, that's pretty much been a fact for, you know, for centuries. I mean, you get somebody as smart as Martin Armstrong, and he probably argued that point, but from a long, long-term perspective, it ebbs and it flows. You go from a gold standard, which isn't the best, but it's been one of the best, into morphing to a fiat standard that collapses and then come back into an uh, asset-based currency. So it goes, kind of goes, and this is very broad brush. It's not the exact monetary history, certainly not, but it's sound money, non-sound money, failure, back to sound money, off sound money, failure, back to sound money. That's kind of the, again, broad brush view. So if that's the case, that for the next system to really work, maybe proposing a CBDC that doesn't work and needing to back buy gold, and the East has most of the gold. And there's also a, a subset to that as a kind of a proof, like you're doing a proof on a math equation. And a proof is if you fall where the gold trail is, it's always the producing nation. So if you go back pre-US, where the US held most of the gold, it was held by Great Britain. And they were the main producers. Yes, it was a colonial system and all that. But under the UK umbrella, they produced the most and had the most gold. Then you go to World War II, and we, the U.S., produced the most production, and mostly w the war machine, and then post the war, housing, cars, freeways, everything else. And all the gold, not all, but the lion's share of the gold went to the U.S. Now the lion's share of the gold has gone to China. So it just follows. You can say, well, wait a minute. If you just you know, follow the money... One of the best things we can do in journalism, uh, you know, it doesn't, uh, you know, get the personalities out, get the bias out, get the politics out. Just look at where the money's flowing. It's gone from the UK to the US to China. What does that mean? Well, it suggests strongly that you're right, that we're going to see the Chinese 
have the commanding, maybe not currency, maybe not global currency, but certainly a much higher status in the financial market or the monetary system than what we see today. And if you take it a step further and look at the, their CBDC, which is by far the most advanced and most utilized in the world, maybe that's it. And they're just using their gold as a, you know, as a backup plan or as a subtle way to reinforce their power if they get resistance to it. I don't know. I don't know the future, but I do know what it looked like in the past. And as Mike Maloney says, the further you can look back, usually the more you could go forward. So there's a guy named Bill Still. You can look him up. He did a pretty good analysis on what the gold situation in Fort Knox is. And let's just look at it the other way. Let's say all the gold that's purportedly in Fort Knox, all, I think right now it's like 263 million troy ounces is there. Location doesn't prove ownership. So every ounce that's on paper could be there, but yet it could be loaned out, it could be swapped out, it could be used as collateral for foreign exchange purposes. It could be... Um, Plunge protection team. So there's a lot to it, a lot more than seeing a line item written down on an official document that says U.S. gold dot, 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 and puts a number out there. I mean, I don't buy into that. For me, I want a strong audit. I want to see really, you know, not only where it's located, but who's the owner of it. The gold at Fort Knox has not been fully audited since the early 1950s, despite many very vocal public requests. The secrecy and performative audits over the years have made people very suspicious of not just the ownership of the gold, but also of its location. Only a transparent full audit will assure the public that what was once touted as the nation's gold is still in place. Without that, and considering China's secrecy about the real amount of its gold holdings, it is safe to assume the Asian country is getting very close to surpassing our reserves. David Morgan is certain that gold and silver will take a more prominent place in investing and global finance in the future. Do you agree with his assessment? Please drop your comments in the comments section below, give this video a thumbs up, subscribe to the channel, and check out our other videos. Thanks for watching.